when it came to the Axie Infinity hack, it took the team one week to even find out that they were missing seven hundred million dollars. Wow, uh, that's, right. <laughs> that's a pretty big oversight, I, I'd say. It is. Damn. It is. Well, I mean, one week to to <laughs> to uh, to realize that is uh, personally, I think that's a big problem. Yeah. Uh, and if we want to mature in the space, we can't we can't have record breaking years of hacking events year after year. Hello and welcome to Proof of Talk, the cryptocurrency podcast where we invite leaders and builders into the space to come on and talk about their experience in the industry as well as the projects and products that they've been building. My name is Andre and I've been in the cryptocurrency space since 2017. I've also helped co-found algorithmic crypto trading platform Acer that enables users to quickly and easily automate their trades while managing the risk. I'm here today with Christian who is the head of partnerships at Unchained.ai. How are you man? Doing well. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. I was talking to um, this guy that's working for a mining company a few um, a few episodes ago, and they're providing like the, the the pool to mine. They're also connecting. You know, they they have a pool, and they also have other services around that. They have some financial services that I thought are really interesting, because obviously the halving is going to have a big impact on the miners. Their their rewards are going to halve, so it's going to become a lot more expensive to mine, and the profit margins, whatever they may be now, they could be completely gone. So they offer a way for miners to buy their their like their hash rate. Um, rewards in advance, almost as a hedge to what to to the rewards uh, that are gonna have. So you could you could buy now and lock in a certain reward, not to lose uh, when the when the halving happens, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, I used to use a service like that back in the day. Um, just uh, I think it was called like cloud mining. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. Yeah, super interesting. Interested to sort of uh, listen back to your podcast and you know learn more about what this uh, company is doing for sure. Yeah, well, I was trying to. I mean, not trying, but I was considering getting into mining a few years back, and I felt like I was pretty late to the game. I could never make the numbers work, and I thought, well, a GPU just doesn't make sense. It's all about getting ASICs miners, but then ASICs, you could, yeah, you could mine with one ASIC, and you could make I don't know thirty, fifty dollars a month if you wanted to. But if you really want to, just you know. It, I feel like it's just not worth the hassle unless you buy, I don't know, 50 ASICs. Like you invest right. in that and then you start big. Um, Maybe uh, a cheap energy source as so. well. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's always harder to come by, especially <laughs> since electricity prices have been skyrocketing across the whole of Europe. I'm not sure if in the States it has been similar, but in, in, in the UK and in the rest of Europe, electricity prices have significantly increased. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, even just like over the weekend, right? Like, uh, since, you know, again, these global conflicts continue, uh, yeah. gas prices are just going up. Energy cost goes up. Um, yeah, it creates a lot of instability. Um, and that's another thing that I'm like super excited about when it comes to just Bitcoin miners in general. Um, as you mentioned, right they're uh, it's just going to get more expensive for them to be profitable due to the supply shock. Um, you know, so I strongly believe that there's going to be some Bitcoin mining companies that don't survive this uh, having, right? Yeah. Um, but then those that do succeed, I'm excited to see what the innovation lies, right? Like I've been seeing companies like BitDeer um, that are changing some sort of strategy of like how they're mining, how they're sort of creating efficiencies across like their energy costs by, um, I believe they're the ones that are... Uh, putting like the Bitcoin miners with like w within this thing called like liquid cooling. Um, right. 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 Yeah. Cause they, that's not, it's not electricity. It doesn't con uh, conduct electricity. So you could safely submerge it if you wanted to. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's yeah. what I'm super excited about just to see the innovation that comes out of this space. Yeah, no, that's going to be pretty cool. I think there's also, we're going to see some changes in the, in the actual um, transaction fees. They tend to increase when that happens. And uh, mm. I'm not sure whether because that's algorithmically, uh, you know, uh, coded in or whether validators decide to, okay, guys, in order to like keep, you know, validating, we need to increase the, um, the fees, which would make sense. Right. So how did you get into crypto? Uh, just like everyone else, uh, <laughs> listen, like, well, 
I hope that many people got into crypto by being on Twitter. Um, but I mean, the first time the first time I heard about crypto was uh, specifically Bitcoin. Uh, one of my friends was a big CS:GO player, and uh, you know, and I was still in school, and they were making money by playing CS:GO, earning skins, selling the skins for Bitcoin. Oh wow! Uh, and so uh, that's, that's like the first time that I ever heard of it. Um, when I actually like went deep into the, the space and, and started, you know, just aping in and, and becoming a crypto maximalist uh, was uh, one of my first uh, jobs out of college was uh, working for a VC firm. Um, mm-hmm. Our specific thesis was artificial intelligence. Right. Uh, so my and, and we were backed by Qualcomm, uh, literally That's right cool. across the, the Qualcomm campus. So a lot of the research that we were doing was around uh, hardware um, or, you know, how would the software increase hardware capabilities? And Right. So of- maximizing, maximizing hardware efficiency when using machine learning models. Exactly. Okay. Right. Um, or just al- algorithmic models in general. Right. Uh, so as I'm doing my research as an al- analyst, um, I came across this website, um, which in retrospect, I believe it was actually like cloud mining, um, where basically, okay. uh, you know, you buy into this this website and then they would yield Bitcoin for you. Um, yeah. So I was super interested by just the website design in general. Um, so I'm like, okay, what is this? Uh, turns out it was Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Uh, due to sort of like my experience dealing with hardware, I started diving deep into like in just Bitcoin uh, mining machines and SHA-256 as the algorithm that powered Bitcoin. Right. Uh, you know, so uh, that's really where I dove in, right? Just like the algorithm algorithm that powers Bitcoin. Um, and then everything there and after is sort of uh, history, right? Learning about, you know, the protocol, the network, uh, reading the white paper. Yeah. And so on. That's cool, man. That's I remember doing a, a similar thing. Like I was reading the white paper and then reading about... Uh, the encryption algorithm and what it does and why we need, you know, all, and all the intricacies of, of the Bitcoin algorithm itself, like the difficulty rate and the hash rate and then how the difficulty adjusts. And, and you kind of, you go, you, you're, it's, you're very likely to go down a rabbit hole of, of all of these things. And I felt like once I understood Bitcoin and then I started like altcoins started happening and started coming out and Ethereum started becoming a thing. It's like, whoa. This is this is way over what I expected that we could do with digital currency, and I always feel like I got into crypto twice. I got once when I was actually well, mining on a GPU. I was mining Bitcoin on a GPU a while ago. I think maybe in I don't know 2014, 2013, and then I lost that Bitcoin forever, and I forgot about it, and I well I couldn't recover it, and then I got back into crypto in 2017, and I stuck with it. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I feel a lot of people have had that experience where they kind of go in once. Something happens, they lose their backs, they forget about it, they come and revisit sometime later. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, I've, I've stuck to it since, uh, since I learned <laughs> about it. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's sort of something that I, uh, I like to believe I eat, sleep, um, and talk about crypto 24 7. Right. It's sort of embedded into uh, my lifestyle now. Yeah. I, that's well, cool, man. I'm not a crypto bro. Uh, I, yeah. I, don't have that stereotype <laughs> <laughs> no that's cool I, I i try not to talk to a lot of people about well apart from my podcast really not talk to people about crypto a lot just because i just you know how people just tend to kind of have a very uh, kind of skeptical look of uh, like t- they tend to look weird at you if you're telling them well, i'm into crypto i'm investing in crypto or i think like blockchain technology is the future like it feels like it like the hype is out there in the mainstream, but the understanding of blockchain technology and its use cases is still very much far away. And that kind of gives a really good space, you know, for, for a conversation like this and for, for a space like this to highlight the products that are being built on top of this, you know, products like, like Unchained, for instance, like it's not, I'm sure it's something that's incredibly useful for the industry itself, but a lot of people on the outside might not even like, It'd be like, so what is this? What does it do? Why do we need, you know, AI on on top of a of a blockchain? Um, but it's interesting you've you've done your thesis on AI and then started working within crypto and AI. I feel that that's kind of a very nice mix of both of these things which you're passionate about. Um, 
and I'm guessing shortly after you started working for Unchain. Yeah, sorry, what was that? I totally missed it. No, that's cool, man. So I was just saying, once you've done your research and your thesis, you, you moved on to Unchain? Uh, no. Um, so uh, from that sort of VC experience, um, I then and went to work for Salesforce. Um, oh, I see. So uh, at Salesforce, I actually worked um, doing BD and growth stuff, right? So the okay. side of things. Um, so that was half of my role, but the other half was just due to my, you know, high interest in, in AI and emerging technologies, I had the opportunity to work under the Futures Lab department. Um, the Futures right. Lab department, you can think of this as like their innovation department or their X department where uh, secret projects go on. Um, and part of my work there was create proof of concepts for the year 2030, present this to the chief future officer who I reported directly. Um, and then all of this information would then go to the CEO and Salesforce Ventures so that they can invest um, with a 10-year roadmap. Uh, right. And when I sort of, you know, basically they, you know, put out the cards on the table and say, these are all going to be the technologies that we believe based off of our research that are going to be pivotal uh, or structural technology by 2030. Um, the technology that was left out was blockchain. Huh. So uh, I took it upon myself of challenging the team and saying, hey, um, you know, I strongly believe blockchain is going to be emerged and, you know, in, intertwined with, with AI, with 5G, with IoT. Yeah. Um, in fact, I personally believe that it was going to be uh, part of that layer of the tech stack um, where all of these technologies would actually come together and synchronize. Um, so that's sort of like what I did, um, and was presenting on, uh, you know, how blockchain technology was going to revolutionize the use cases of autonomous vehicles, of IOT, um, create efficiencies across supply chains. Uh, yeah. so that's what I did at Salesforce from then, then from Salesforce, I went to go work for an AI company, uh, specifically an automation company, um, and, uh, worked there for two and a half years, but throughout those two and a half years. Again, I challenged the executive team. Why aren't we selling into Web3 companies? Why aren't we? Um, because we were selling to like traditional Web2 companies, Broadcom, Visa, uh, Workday, right. et cetera. Um, and I saw a huge opportunity for Web3 to automate Web3 processes um, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of like what I, uh, you know, led forward for two and a half years. Then FTX happened. Uh, you know, just the crypto crash happened through AC, Celsius, Voyager, all these companies yeah. went down, huge market crash, as we all know. Uh, and I saw that as a huge opportunity to double down and go full time into Web3. Um, it was the riskiest time to go into Web3 because everything it, literally- It was, 100%. Uh, and yeah, I've been at Anchain ever since. Um, and, you know, now we're, we're back into a bull market. So I'm really excited about um, our future here. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I, I guess it's, in a way, it's really good that you you went into crypto at that time because out of the companies that still survived, you know that if they made it through a bear market, they're going to make it through a bull market and actually really fly. So it's, it, 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 you know, yeah, it's, that's very good. Um, so do you want to give a brief overview of, of Unchained AI, what the, what the vision of the product is, what some of the features are, and what's what's its scope and role within the blockchain industry? Yep, definitely. Um, so we're one of the uh, leading Web3 and risk management, or leading uh, Web3 security and with, and uh, risk management companies. Um, essentially, we have a product suite um, that covers sort of security uh, in mm -hmm. Web3, how to secure smart contracts, how to secure essentially your ecosystem um, by having tabs onto smart contracts, right? Right. So, um, doing the whole smart contract audit, but then a, a layer of having monitoring, real-time monitoring solutions uh, to that of every single smart contract event. Right. Uh, when a specific function happens, when, you know, keys are switched, um, when, you know, liquidity is added, so on and so forth. Um, so that's one of the aspects that we do from a security standpoint. Um, and then as well as understanding which addresses are entering your ecosystem. Uh, if, you know, most dApps today don't do KYC, due to the nature of decentralization, 
Right. So understanding who is behind an address, assuming that we have data on that. If not, uh, providing a risk score to the address or the transaction. Hey, this transaction okay. might be risky. This individual might be risky. Um, the way I like an to... AML, essentially. Yep, exactly. Um, it, that's exactly the solution that we're offering. Uh, you know, an AML solution, KYT, KYW, know your transaction, know your wallet. Um, right. So that's sort of, you know, on that to topic, it transitions a bit to risk, uh, risk management. How do you manage your risk as a Web3 entity? Um, so we have, you know, solutions around that. Um, blockchain investigation, compliance solutions, uh, you know, smart contract, risk and evaluation uh, solutions and so on. Um, so that's sort of what we do. Um, you know, some interesting things is as, as a, comp because of our tooling and our investigation, we have a lot of intelligence across the Web3 sector. Um, so uh, we're one of, or the first one actually, um, you know, according to Bloomberg, uh, to bring um, uh, forward the intelligence to Bloomberg to whistleblow on FTX and Alameda. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, so, uh, we basically analyzed their on-chain activity and noticed that there was, uh, you know, activity between those two firms, uh, you know, exchanging, right? right? So, um, so we brought sort of this information forward to Bloomberg. Bloomberg put out right. an article. I think Cointelegraph picked it up, ZZ and, and uh, SPF went at it on Twitter, and then the rest of his, his history. So um, was it something that you were doing as a public good, or was it, um, were you doing it as a bit of research for, for someone, or were you guys paid to do that, or did you just choose to do it? Um, so uh, the nature of our work is uh, blockchain intelligence. So right. um, if you're familiar with chain analysis, um, I think yeah. they're a, a household name at this point. Um, you know, we're, we're next generation solutions to that of chain analysis due to our AI capabilities and our expertise when it comes to smart contract uh, analytics. Um, so we work with a lot of different law enforcement agencies and governments. So part of our, our work is, you know, you know, analyze the biggest players and make sure you're having tabs on them. Um, right. So when Bloomberg reached out to us and said, hey, you know, we believe that there's something fishy here. You know, do you mind doing the due diligence? That's when we went ahead and, you know, brought forward the, um, the findings that we did. Right. That makes sense. Okay. So, the, and that's interesting. You've, you've said that you work with, um, regulators in the U S government and, you know, potentially other agencies too, because I was looking on your website and I, I saw in your SOC solution that trusted partners, um, the U S government was listed as one of the trusted partners. Um, if you don't mind talking about what kind of relationship you guys have with the government or what kind of uh, agencies you work with and what kind of reporting you do from the chain. I feel that would be super relevant for people in the space. Yep, definitely. Um, you know, and th there's no secret, right? We have Forbes article out there disclosing a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, so, you know, we work with essentially all agencies that have an involvement in our financial uh, space. Right. So the SEC, um, the IRS, um, you know, FinCEN. Right. So anyone that sort of manages or oversees some sort of financial movement within uh, the U.S., you know, these are, are our clients. And, and then we also work with law enforcement agencies. Um, you know, for example, if you get hacked today um, out of your NFTs, out of your crypto uh, or if you get scammed, right, fall in love with someone on Tinder, it turns out to be a scammer. Next thing you know, you sent them, you know, your life savings, you know, where do you go? Right. Um, and if we're trying to mature this space and believe that crypto is the future of money, um, you know, then these agencies must be equipped to be able to solve the problems of, of what the citizens are facing today. Right. right. Um, due to, to their adoption um, of this technology. So, so we work across all of these different agencies uh, with these different agencies in terms of like crypto recovery, uh, intelligence, you know, trying to un uncover who these scammers are, trying to see which exchanges they're using to liquidate funds. Um, it's no secret today that if you wanted to launder funds, you're not going to do it on crypto where everything's transparent. You're going to do it with on with cash because there's no way to track cash. Yeah. Um, 
right? So that's sort of like the the misconception here that a lot of uh, <laughs> you know Congress people, at least in the U.S., have. Um, so our part of our solution is trying to find those liquidation points after a specific transaction, um, and then we're using AI to sort of streamline um, the investigation of you know. Let's say, for example, this NFT has a unique ID. We can follow that NFT across wherever it moves, right? right. With, with, with currencies, because they're fungible, it's a little bit different. Um, but that's essentially mm. how we're using AI. But again, that's how we're working with government agencies. Um, you know, for example, when, uh, when the Harmony hack uh, happened, um, you know, we were called on um, or hired by some of these law enforcement and uh, three-letter agencies to figure out you know, who it was, what happened, you know, we're able to uncover its Lazarus group, it's the North Korean hacker group. Right. Um, and, and our goal is try to chase that, those funds and, and recover them before they move to uh, offshore exchanges or exchanges outside of U.S. jurisdictions um, to where we don't really have a say if we were to ask a country uh, or an entity within a specific country of like, hey, you know, return those funds. Right. So, yeah. That's sort of the work that, that we're doing with uh, with our government government partners. That's cool. I, I remember writing about the Harmony hack when it happened and uh, like the word was out, but it was just a rumor at that point that uh, it was circulating on Twitter that Ra Lazarus Group is behind it. Um, so it's cool to hear that it was com eventually confirmed that it was indeed the Lazarus Group that, that did it. Yeah, um, I mean, the group is notorious um, yeah. in terms of attacking the crypto ecosystem and, and funding their sort of, uh, their agendas. Yeah. Uh, right. And I personally, you know, based off of my research, I, I like to share with people of like the, the entities that are mo most at risk are what I would like to consider a mom and pop shop, but right. in the crypto space. So your new sort of business that started by developers in college that just raised a million dollars or half a million dollars from investors you know, they're the most vulnerable to these hacking events. Um, and these are sort of the entities that this group is usually attacking because less noise is done when they do sort of, um, you know, hack these these entities. Whereas if yeah. they hack a really big entity, then all the eyes are on them, um, you know, and, and you have more people trying to recover those funds. Yeah, there are also very different risks when you when you think about coding or programming um, in Web3 than, you know, traditional programming. Like the fact that the technology is so new, there have been vulnerabilities in the code base itself. There have been vulnerabilities in the programming language, vulnerabilities in cross-chain bridges, and just so many things that could could trip you up. So I think I think it's definitely like a great thing to have a kind of tool or solution to act as a safety net for these. I could call them mom and pop shop, right? Right. Um, but when when it comes to the government, so you were saying before that you were you guys were hired to conduct this investigation. So I'm guessing the nature of your work with uh, agencies in general is you're being you're being allocated this work rather than you providing them the software as a sort of software as a service kind of solution with them. Is that right? Uh, well, both both uh, and okay. so we provide the software um, and then we train agents or individuals. Right points officers, um, even crypto sleuths, right? So if you ever go on yeah. Twitter and see like a, a specific profile that their job is just- yeah, Zach to, XBT. Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah. we have we have those people as well that, that are um, using our products. Um, when it comes to like way more sophisticated cases, when you start seeing funds get laundered through a DAP uh, or through a DEX and then it gets bridged to a different chain, that's when we're called um, to, to take on those investigations just because of the complexity of, you know, of the transactions that are, that are taking place. And, you know, the person on the other end that's hacking um, is a lot more sophisticated. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So apart from the event with Harmony, have, have you, do you know of any other cases where the Lazarus Group or North Korea were involved in crypto? I know there's many, but I, I don't know exactly which ones they've been ex specifically attributed to North Korea. Um, even outside of crypto, they just don't like to pay bills. Like there's so many services that they hire from the third, like third parties, including building companies and all that. They never pay the bills. It's crazy. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, there, there's, there's many, uh, yeah. right. Uh, one of, one of the biggest ones was, uh, Axie Infinity. Right. 
right? Uh, the the Ronin bridge hack. Um, and in fact, that's actually why we we build um, our latest innovation, which is uh, that security monitoring solution, uh, because there's uh, a lack of immaturity in the Web three space when it comes to security. Um, there's this belief that you know blockchain is immutable, therefore it is secure, and What's not secure is the front end. What's not secure is, right. um, you know, uh, different sort of functions within a contract that weren't sort of programmed correctly, that they might still have like, uh, you know, some missing variables or the variables that they used uh, for the function are, are vulnerable or are an easily attack vector. Yeah. Um, it can also be the bridges, um, right? So any sort of Oracle or integration that might be connected to the contract can be vulnerable. Um, so, I, I mean, long story short, right? When it came to the Axie Infinity hack, it took the team one week to even find out that they were missing $700 million. Wow. Uh, that's, right? that's a pretty big oversight, I, I'd say. It is. Damn. It is. Well, I mean, one week to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to realize that is, uh, personally, I think that's a big problem. Yeah, uh, and if we sure. want to mature in the space, we can't we can't have record breaking years of hacking events year after year. Um, so uh, it, it took the team one week to figure it out, and then it took them a month to even patch the vulnerability. So the vulnerability was still open for a whole month, assuming there were any funds um, left. You know, they were still you know open to the public for for a month. Um, and yeah. when, when we did research across all hacking events including that of Harmony and many others, we noticed that there's, there's around that one week um, standard in Web3 uh, to realize that hacks are happening or to even announce that a hack has happened. Um, so in the regular Web2 space, uh, the, the average time to detect um, is five hours. So our question is, how can we sort of bring it to that sort of standard? Right and mature the, the the Web three space from a security standpoint to that standard. Um, so you know our sort of solution is: can we set up rules and logic for a system that is listening to every single function that is of importance? And if that right. function is ever called, notify the team immediately. Um, and then the, the then the security team or the IT team can then respond to it. Uh, so that's essentially what what we built. Um, and it's sort of, you know, our solution of trying to uh, bring that average down to detect a, a hack um, to, a, you know, a smaller time frame than a week. A week is yeah. like unacceptable. It, it's, it's unacceptable. And by that time, the money has been laundered like 20 times over. It's so hard to follow the trail at that point. Like, like you said before, it's not like it's you're not following an NFT, which you know exactly where it goes. You're following an amount, and that amount splits and changes, and you got to take out the gas fees, and you got to figure out where the the like. And, and if you're taking it through a mixer or like a you know coin anonymizer or whatever, it's very hard to keep track of. Actually, do, do you are you guys able to keep track of the of the balances and the coins stolen if they're being Put through a mixer? Uh, so we do do that type of work. That work is very complex. Yeah. It, 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 takes, it takes a team of, uh, you know, analysts to try to identify, like, you know, if, if, you know, as an example, if $5 enter Tornado Cash, where did $5 come out of? And, and what wallet just has five, uh, $5 now? And then we have to go and analyze the ledger, um, look right. at the the specific time frame, understand the time that it takes from a transaction to go through Tornado Cash and uh, populate it, you know, the funds in a different wallet. Uh, it is sort of work that we've done in the past. It's definitely work that we do not like to do. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. It, yeah. Because if, if you're a relatively capable uh, hacker, you, you wouldn't put $5 through and get $5 out. You'd put $5 in and get 30p here, 20p there, $1 there, another dollar there, it would be split across 50 wallets or something. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's difficult, right? Uh, and I think this is why some governments understand the, the sophistication of, you know, of Tornado Cash or these mixers. Um, and, you know, that's why they're now sanctioned um, because yeah. of that nature of we can't figure out 
you know, where funds go after they get laundered through here. Yeah. And, and you know what? I get it from, uh, from a government perspective. It is, yeah, it, it is a, a problem. Though I don't agree with sentencing the guy for life for coding it. He's been, you know, sentenced for just writing code. Right. Not in an illegal way. Like he did any, every line of that code, you break it down. He didn't try to exploit any system or get in anywhere or do anything, you know, against, against the law. Yet he got, yeah, I think it was life sentence. Right. For, for yeah. and, and we have a, a few of those, right, of, of coders yeah. building products um, and, and now having serving life sentences, which is, you know. Yeah. It's, it's a bit crazy. It's, it's a political debate for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I also noticed on the, on the same page where you had listed it, like the U.S. government, you also had listed Salesforce, which is pretty interesting because you said you, you were working, you worked at Salesforce before. Um, was that connection made because of your experience at Salesforce? Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't, um, <laughs> even though I would have loved to take a lot of pride in, in that. Um, uh, it was prior to me joining. Uh, right. But uh, I do, I do strongly want to believe that the Salesforce initiative was started because of me, um, which was you know accepting a blockchain solution, and it came out of the same lab where I was discussing blockchain when no one else was. That's cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's Salesforce's Web three initiative uh, or their Web three cloud, uh, and I. You know, the goal of, of it was to create sort of a tokenized loyalty program, uh, you know, with the end clients of Salesforce's clients. Um, okay. So one, in, one of the, the companies was like Scotch and Soda, which is a fashion brand. Um, and they wanted to create uh, a loyalty solution, right? Um, you buy the NFT, you get access to, um, you know, our pop-up events uh specific discounts right um, you're the first one to be notified of a specific new merch line or a drop um so that's essentially what it was um and i say what it was because i'm not quite sure if it's still live um i think they've toned down their their web3 uh, sort of development there uh but what we did was uh we did two things one of them was authored their uh some of their smart contracts so we actually wrote them oh, um, I see. And the second one was we audited the ones that we didn't write. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's sort of uh, our, our role, um, you know, at, at Salesforce. And we also do that across many different protocols, uh, which is where, uh, you know, the synergies came to be. Right. That's cool. So Salesforce was, was trying to get into the Web3 space with this reward system. They just decided not to follow through at the end. I guess. I'm not. I'm not quite sure if it's like if you're a Salesforce customer, if you can still reach out and say, "Hey, yeah, uh, you know, I'd like the solution." Um, yeah, I just know that they haven't sort of done more, right? It's it's not sort of a a continuous development program that they have. Right. And out of curiosity, when when was when did this happen? Did it happen around the like peak bull run period? There's so yeah. many companies that just, yeah, that's funny though. It's funny that they would think of joining in like 2021 or something, but everything's just crazy hyped. Right. I, I, I think they, if I'm not mistaken, they launched it like right after um, the downturn. of Right. And I it took think them like, a few months to make the decision and then eventually it followed through. But yeah. Right. And I think like NFTs at the time didn't fall as fast as the crypto market did. I think there was still like, some hype around NFTs, um, if my memory serves me well. Uh, yeah. As, as I remember being at NFT New York City when uh, like Celsius just stopped withdrawals. Uh, <laughs> and that's sort of like what was, you know, starting the cascade of, of, uh, of the down cycle or, or the bear market. Yeah. Yeah, I remember similar things. I think NFTs just kept dropping in value, but on a relatively slow, at a relatively slow pace compared to cryptocurrency, it was right. yeah, it was a wild ride. So, do, do you expect then Salesforce to join Web three space again well, at the peak of this bull run? Or uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think every enterprise company is going to be late again. Yeah, right? um, it's funny how it happens. Right, I, may, maybe they start adopting sort of like the Bitcoin strategy, which is you know have Bitcoin in your balance sheet. 
Um, yeah. But from a Web3 initiative, yeah, I, th I think like all of these enterprises are going to be late. Once again, they're going to chase, uh, chase the hype, but they're going to allow like the hype to prove itself first, right? So we're going to see, you know, uh, the the degens building and all these like small startups or just Web three companies building, and then eventually we'll see um, another adoption of of, uh, of these enterprises. Oh yeah, and personally, I don't mind the bear market. I feel like it's it's a very kind of it's a very good time to build stuff or to connect on the tech side and you know kind of talk about what cryptocurrency can do, what not 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 what the price is, you know. And and you can see that even on uh, if you look at subreddits like cryptocurrency, like most most of the time the the discussion is around the price or around some piece of news that comes out that day. There's very little technical discussion very little right. hey this is what people are building now in the crypto space which i feel like it's lacking it's lacking severely especially on a community as big as that um i meant to say that's why that's why farcaster is really good mm. that's kind of the the ethos there people don't talk about the price as much as they do about the technology and it's a really fascinating piece of 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 like of technology itself the fact that it uses Web3 and blockchain to store, I think they're hashed messages. I think the information is private and you get a, a decryption key if you get a client and you run the Farcaster um, know yourself. But you can build any UI. That's the thing. The, like the UI and Farcaster, the data in Farcaster I, are completely decoupled. You could build a UI that does different things. You could make it work like Twitter or like a thread forum or you could make it work like a live chat or something. Like you've got so much freedom and Warpcast is just one client for Farcaster. It's pretty fun. Interesting. Yeah, I definitely need to check it out. I've heard of a lot of great things and some of the biggest sort of brands in, in Web3 are are on there, right? They've they have their own like uh, company profile. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even from a growth perspective, like as a growth tool, I think it's 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 still early on and early enough that you could actually, you know, grow your your following easier than you would on Twitter. Like I've seen that so long as you engage and you interact, your following is going to grow and you will also get, I think, um, highlighted if you are very active on the sub on, um, on Farcaster, you'll, your, your account will be highlighted just continuing the growth of your account, which is pretty nice. No, that's awesome. Uh, I'm always, yeah. uh, I'm always up for, uh, increasing my following base for sure. <laughs> nice. That's cool, man. Um, so I, I meant to ask, uh, one of the questions that I actually had prepared was uh, the difference between the CISO solution and SOC. Because the CISO is AI forensic and SOC is, in my head, they're very similar. So if you could just explain what the, how do they work in yep. a different way, what's different about them? Definitely. Um, so, uh, so the CISO solution um, is uh, our blockchain investigation and analytics tool. This is okay. where... Um, you know, if you're an exchange and a suspicious transaction goes into your ecosystem and it gets flagged by our API, um, then you would perform a stricter due diligence process on that transaction right. to understand, you know, making sure that this is not like, you know, a terrorist group or, uh, you know, if it's flagged for whatever sort of like high, you know, uh, high alert, performing that due diligence, having that report, and then you know, your compliance procedure or based off of uh, whoever regulator you're supposed to be, you know, filing these for, um, that's what that tool is, is done, right? So that's for from a private sector standpoint. Um, right. From, from a public sector standpoint, that tool is used to investigate transactions, um, you know, find, cri uh, find criminals, recover funds, um, so on and so, so forth. Uh, right. So the the... The Web3 SOC uh, product, SOC stands for uh, Security, Security Operations Center. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of like a hub to keep tabs on uh, your smart contract or the smart contracts that you're analyzing um, and different functions. One of the functions um, that, I, that I sort of like think it's, it's very interesting is you can... Uh, set up the workflow to where you're getting triggered every time that Tether or Bitfinex is adding a blacklist um, 
well, is adding an address to its blacklist uh, right. function, right? So um, uh, Bitfinex is sort of the entity that goes into the Tether protocol and and uh, calls these functions and has these capabilities. Um, so you can actually set up our tool to where you're getting notified in real time when that happens. Then what you go ahead and do is you also flag that address across uh, your client base, right? Because uh, a, a Tether address is an EVM compatible address. Right. So if Tether is blacklisting it, the question is why should you go and do the same thing for Avalanche, Binance, Ethereum, um, and, and all these different networks where that address also lives? Um, right. So that's that's what that is. That's what uh, the, the tool is not for that specific use case, but the tool is for how can I keep tabs um, across these smart contracts, you know, to reduce my vulnerability measures from a security standpoint. Um, that makes sense. And then there's a lot within the tool that you can do, such as like, you, ha you have a, a communications plan within the tool. If my, you know, entity was ever to get hacked, who do I need to reach out to? Do I need to reach out to a law enforcement agency right away, have them be on the case? Um, do I need to let our CEO know, let our CFO know? Uh, do I need to let a PR company know or whatever it might be, right? So like, that's where you're gonna have all of that sort of communication plan um, so that your team is equipped and they're not caught off guard when something wrong does happen. So our goal is like, can we start to ingrate this level of maturity and consciousness to teams that are managing you know, millions of, of, of dollars of assets under management through their protocol or through their ecosystem. Uh, and that's the only way that we're going to mature this place, this space and bring uh, peace of mind to institutions that are dealing with these companies. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing here. When you ask like, do you think enterprises are going to chase the bull market? I think they're only going to chase say if the risk management procedures are set in place. Right. Because like the biggest thing about an enterprise launching a Web3 initiative is, is the, le the legal aspect and the risk management aspect. Because yeah. they don't, in, in fact, enterprises are, are the first ones to experiment with any new technology. We're seeing this across AI, we've seen it across generative AI, robotics. Uh, Amazon launched, you know, is building robots, Tesla is building robots, right? Yeah. Um, but when we're dealing with cryptocurrencies because of its history with the SEC issuing subpoenas to companies, um, you know, and it being sort of like a gray area of like hackings are prevalent um, and all these other things, risk management sort of like the first thing. Like I, I talked to a company, like all they wanted to do was tokenize. Um, they were trying to tokenize real estate, but they weren't even trying to tokenize real estate. They were just trying to tokenize a contract. Right. And it was like, like when, when this person explained it to me, it was very straightforward, like very simple of what they were trying to do. They were basically just trying to uh, issue an NFT with that of like the the, the mortgage of the of, or the contract of of the of the property. That's right. it. We're just trying to give you like a certificate of authenticity, like you are in fact the owner. Here's an NFT, like nothing complex, nothing sophisticated. But in order to just do that, they needed to go through a year long cycle with the legal firm, and. You know, when when that is being shared to me, it's like the problem to mass adoption is risk management. Like it's the compliance side, it's the legal side, it's making sure that if they're gonna launch an experiment, that it doesn't go wrong to like now they have lawyers coming at them or now they have a regulator coming at them. And I think that's sort of like the nature of the industry, at least here in the US, um, which is, you know, a country that is heavily regulated for, you know, in, in many aspects when it comes to our financial system or when we're, when we're launching financial based products. Um, yeah. So that's sort of like my, uh, my, my gist there. And I know it kind of went a little bit away from, uh, from the question around the tools, but that's where, um, the idea of the tools are coming into place. Yeah, no. And I think that's a very important point to mention. I think corporations, enterprises, just having that kind of confidence in this space it's incredibly important um there's you're just right to point out that there hasn't really been that they, they, they haven't had that level of confidence and that's one of the reasons why a lot of them haven't made the leap into web3 or blockchain and 
uh, I mean, a lot of them are still, I'm, I think they're trying to figure out how to best use this technology. It's apparent to me that AI seems to have more immediate use cases than blockchain. Like if you look at um, Meta's shift, right? Because Meta and Zuckerberg, he was all about a metaverse two years back. And now he's all about AI. It, it's just a lot of these, they seem to have shifted towards something that's more easily monetized, I guess, because AI, you could package it in a product and be like, okay, this this tool does all of these things for you. It's going to cost you this much a month. And the only risk for the company is scraping the data and the, the data set, which is becoming increasingly difficult to do it with a, you know, without breaking a copyright law. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, a lot of lawsuits coming out of that. Um, but at least there's no like financial risk or huge financial risk that you take by creating something. So right. I, I get what, why a lot of the hype has shifted to AI temporarily. I don't think it's going to stay like this. I think that there's definitely going to be more use cases in blockchain. Um, but yeah, I get the resistance for well, adoption. I, uh, I define sort of AI within the metaverse. So, uh, the opposite of the metaverse was, would be the universe. So right. I, we're exploring out of the world or we're going deeper into, you know, our digital consciousness or deeper into sort of like the software aspect rather than like the external side, which would be like hardware. We launch rockets up to space. Right. Uh, so I still, I highly believe like this AI sort of shift is still getting us closer to a reality of what a metaverse can potentially be. Um, Right, because like the evolution of all of these like LLMs is eventually a character because we have yeah. speech, right? But now we needed to actually conceptualize like what is it that I'm talking to? Because um, I, I strongly believe like, I don't think my grandma um, would speak to a software AI, but if it was in a shape of a robot, like a, like a pet, um, then I think the, the adoption would be uh, more readily available. Um, yeah. So I think that like we're, that's eventually where we're going to be evolving towards. Um, yeah, I could totally see that. I could see um, if you're thinking about metaverse as the traditional vision of the metaverse, having a virtual and immersive virtual world where you have a 3D character, whether you go in third person or first person, and then interact with that world at large, other players, as well as NPCs. Like I could see NPCs right. being powered by AI. I've seen a few demos. I think there's this guy that made a, like AI Skyrim characters. He's made like, is a, one of the Skyrim characters like Lydia that kind of follows you around. He turned, he gave an AI to that character. So instead of having those predefined three or four lines of conversation has, hey, give me your inventory, leave my party or whatever. You could use your microphone to talk to this AI and it would tell you game lore. It would act as if, you know, they belong to that game world and it would just interact with you in that way. Um, like if I would have that in VR, that just like my mind would be blown to just directly <laughs> interact with AI naturally. Right. And a lot of time in that is where, uh, where Llama 3 comes into place, right? Like Meta already has the Meta Quest. Um, yeah. You know, and then it has Instagram, Facebook, and all these social networks. Like, uh, I think the strategy is there personally. I, I think um, eventually we'll see it sort of like all harmonize into one big virtual world. If not, if if we're not sort of living it already, and we're just not conscious of it. Yeah, no, it's entirely possible. Um, so Ray Kurzweil's prediction of achieving singularity, he still believes is going to be twenty forty. So that's sixteen years from now. That's 16 years where, according to him, our human intelligence is going to increase a million fold. It's just nuts, man. It's a, it's a very exciting time and it's a, it's kind of crazy yeah. to be there. And it's it's cool to see what, you know, um, new ideas are coming out of this space, both AI and blockchain. And I, I guess An Unchain is at, well, it's between both of these solutions, right? Because you are using AI in the blockchain. Yep. Yeah. So... Uh... You know, it's in the name, it's embedded in the name, it's embedded right. in the company culture. Um, and in, in many of our experiences, like our, like, you know, myself and our coworkers experiences. Um, so everything that we're doing has a foundational AI model. Uh, 
to just build specific efficiencies across different workflows or use cases, mm-hmm. uh, right? So in the case of investigations, in the case of alerting, uh, you know, and you know, we're we're continuing to to build more more models or, or use cases as sort of new uh, new AI models come to place, right? Like Llama or OpenAI or so, and so on and so forth. Right. So do you have your own data sets? Uh, do you train your own AIs or do you use uh, available data sets and, and AIs and machine learning algorithms? Yep, it's it's a mixture of both. Um, we do have uh, a few patents across some of our models. Um, like one of them is a machine learning risk model where okay. you're basically aggregating all addresses, your blockchain activity, and then giving you a risk score based off of uh, the different risk management measures that, that we're seeing. Right. Okay. That's interesting. So your risk assessment tool, the, that's the one that's using AI, right? Um, it acts, well, it could almost act as a KYC, well, KYC in a way, or, or not really KYC, but AML, making sure it's not suspicious account, not money laundering. But does that constitute any, does it have any legal basis? Like, because I, I suppose as a KYC or AML firm, you, you're you kind of giving a certificate or something, you're checking some personal data. Your AI is only checking whatever information there's on chain about this wallet's history is that right. enough to uh, be like okay with kyc this customer we can proceed to sell them a service or whatever the first thing that we're that we're screening for is the sanctions database and known illicit actors that's like the first thing that does have some sort of like legal um uh acknowledgement i guess would, right. would say so like for example we're, we're aggregating all of these different uh databases from across the globe, right, that have a sanctions database. Like, uh, you know, one that I can share that's relevant is, for example, Israel has a specific uh, counterintelligence, you know, government website where uh, it has added uh, many uh, addresses from Farhad, which is an Iranian extremist group, from right. Hamas, from Hezbollah. Um, and it's basically said, hey, these addresses have been sanctioned uh, by the Israeli government due to uh, their role in terrorist financing. Our goal right. is to aggregate all of those addresses, put it into our database, and then try to, uh, and then with our machine learning models, find all of those uh, associated addresses that have interacted with that address. Right? Because right. a lot of the funding for those specific addresses have came from from a uh, second degree connection. Right. So then that second degree connection now has an associated risk. Right. So but is it possible you'd have um, false flags there if you were to highlight someone that's just happened to interact but without meaning to? With, with a, yeah, with so a... the, the possibility for a false positive is always there, which is why we, we offer that uh, CISO tool so that you can actually go and do your due diligence and you as the entity can make that call. We're just right. here to run with intelligence and a level of risk. Um, it is still up to you, the human, to make that conscious decision based off of the facts that have been provided to you. That makes sense. That, that, that's, that's reasonable. It's always reasonable to have a human kind of double check something before right. they make the call. Uh, that's so- my, my concept of like where automation doesn't necessarily overtake human work because you... At, you will always need a human to, uh, to verify, um, you know, the things that have been automated by by AI or different models. Yeah, and, and you also need humans to kind of keep this technology in check or to maintain this technology. Or I'm sure we'll get to a point where AI can train itself and then can create new code to improve itself. We're not probably not far off. I'd say maybe I don't know two years, three years. That the, the the pace at which this industry is evolving is kind of scary. So yeah. I'm sure it will keep evolving at that at that pace. The only limitation is probably going to be electricity and hardware because it costs insane amounts of money to train this um, and uh, huge amounts of electricity. But given you know the amount of funds that Microsoft has, like I'm not concerned that they will continue to just push boundaries with OpenAI as much as they can. I guess, yeah, the, the, the question is uh, where does the human element fit into maintaining this and what kind of control the human element has? 
well, we know the level of control it has right now. It's pretty much, you know, it's it's hundred percent vetted by humans. That's why you also get the difference between, you know, like all the political and ideological ideas that are being fed into certain AIs. That's something that human makes. That's not something that AI right. makes. And that's um, something that a human needs to clean, right? Yeah. Just like how we have janitors in the physical world, we're going to have janitors in the virtual world. And these janitors' job is to clean the data um, because data comes with biases. It comes with historical context. Yeah. History hasn't played out as well as we, as, uh, as we hope it had because we'd be in a much better place if it did. Uh, yeah. So... Um, yeah, I completely agree. Like there's, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? The AI doesn't oh, yeah. know. Anything. Oh yeah. And, and I think the fact that like people seem to, some people seem to be a bit scared or concerned that AI might take their jobs. I don't think it will. I think there might be, even if AI becomes so good that you're not going to need designers and you're not going to need someone to sign off the process, or maybe you're just going to need your head of design to sign off whatever the AI makes and then you get rid of the, the junior level staff. That's possible. But I think it's just a temporary change into a different area. Like you said, you would need, you know, janitors or people to maintain these systems. It's just a shift, a shift from your current skill set onto a slightly different skill set. I don't think it'll replace jobs. I think it'll probably end up creating as many as it replaces in the in the long run. Right. If not even more. Right. So um, that's what I'm excited about. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's really exciting. Do, so do you guys have anything, any new releases or anything exciting planned for 2024, 2025? Uh, so the addition of new chains um, is, is always something that I'm looking forward to. As mm -hmm. new systems start to evolve, we need the solutions that we have built on Ethereum and the more mature chains. Um, we need those capabilities to, to start entering these, these smaller chains. Right. And as you're mentioning, right, like AI is growing at an exponential great, uh, rate. So is, so is Web3. And so are a lot of these newer chains, right? Like, for example, we didn't really have base in the last bull cycle. Now we yeah. have, right? Now we also have SWE. We have um, different sort of blockchain protocols that are gaining a lot of popularity. Um, so that's something that I'm, that I'm always looking forward to. And the addition of a new chain, which means the addition of new use cases. Right. So the Web3 starts to mature. It starts to evolve. Um, you know, we went from uh, DEXs was the big thing to then NFTs. What's the next big thing is uh, right. And there's a, a big topic around deep end technology. Uh, so and, and, and different concepts as well. So as our blockchain analytics solution starts to evolve, the use cases as well. So we're no longer just tracking NFTs and the movement of cryptocurrencies. Yeah. We might be tracking tracing the movement of physical assets uh, in the real world. And we're just seeing the movement on on-chain, right? Because they have like an NFC connected or they have some sort of IoT device that that tracks the movement and we're seeing it as, as an asset, uh, you know, on the ledger. Uh, so that's sort of like what I'm looking forward to and and you know, our new release again is going to be that of of, of new chains. That's cool. One, well, you, which chains do you support right now? Actually, over twenty five different chains. Oh, nice. And Cosmos. Uh, so not Cosmos, the native token. We have uh, we support one L one or one L two on Cosmos, and we're now going to be supporting uh, an additional L two on Cosmos. Uh, that's cool. And yeah, so that's those are the new chains. For many of the, the blockchains that we do support, we have unique partnerships and relationships with these chains. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another uh, interesting aspect of, of our competitive advantage, which is there are specific chains that we're really good at due to um, our relationship with the actual blockchain protocol. Right. So I also meant to ask you, uh, how do you go about connecting this technology to a blockchain? Um, is it at the core level, do you need to involve core developers to to integrate your tech, or is it through a node gateway and anyone can do it so long as they have a node and they can connect and just fetch some data? Uh, both. Um, okay. And then the complexity relies based off of the chain. Right. So yeah. in the in the when you say that you support twenty chains, it means that you have this kind of core connection between for, the. Yeah, for most of them. Okay, that's cool. For, for others, we're using like RPCs. 
RPC. Now. Okay. Any reason why you would you wouldn't just use RPCs? Uh, the speed of actually having the infrastructure, uh, you know, right. built internally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing that if it's embedded right into the code base, then it's it's a lot quicker, less overhead. That makes right. sense. Cool, man. Yeah. Um, it gives us a a stake as well in in the network. Oh yeah, that's a that's a fair point. That sounds right. really cool. Um, I, do you have my last question? Is do you um have any examples where Anchain prevented or helped track a potential dangerous use case and and limited the damage as much as it could and how that worked would be interesting to see behind the scenes um so i wouldn't say hey you know lazarus tried knocking on this door and they weren't able to enter uh because we we, we would most likely not know of it uh because of you know our, our our client is the one that's dealing with that um i would say for every client that Anchain has that has not been hacked, Anchain did the job of of preventing that. Right. Uh, so the last noise that you're that you're seeing coming across our clients, that's a success uh, metric for us. Um, right. Because they're they're using our API, they're using our tools. And if their business is is flowing and it's going great, um, and they're they're not getting issue with the fine, then you know that our solution's working. Um, so uh, yeah, not the best answer that you're probably expecting, um, but uh, no, that's, that, cool. that's, that's, uh, that would be the nature of, of where we're, we're succeeding and, and preventing bad actors. Right. Right. And that's all with on-chain data. And if you're able to connect it to some off-chain data, I'm guessing you will. I think you mentioned that like if you could connect the wallet address have it, you know, okay, we've confirmed that it belongs to this person or this email address. And I'm guessing that's also a database that you yeah. keep some kind yeah. of... Yeah, we offer uh, open source intelligence data or OSINT data. So okay. if there's anything out there that I, that we can connect an address to an entity, to a phone number, to business name, et cetera. Um, right. Yeah, we'll provide that. I guess to answer your question, somewhere where we did prevent it was um, because we did whistleblow on FTX and Alameda. Right. Yeah. That that whole fiasco could have lasted a lot longer, um, and the damage could have probably been a lot bigger than than what it, it, it would. It could have been disastrous. Yeah, imagine le le leaving o o o FTX just uh, run for another two or three years. It could have because yeah. it was the second biggest cryptocurrency exchange, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah. And I, the second biggest, and I believe it's the biggest financial crime. I think it was bigger than Bernie Madoff. If I'm not mistaken. wow, <laughs> yeah. Crazy, absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that chapter is over, man, because it was a it was a really wild time. It was it was crazy. But then it, it also happened very close to the Luna um, crash, which it also did. made everything feel so surreal. Yeah, that's um, where it started, right? Or um, with Luna, with three AC, and then the, yeah, the it became history. There was there was one hack that I recall. I'm not sure. It was around the same period, but probably a few a few months after this had happened. And I don't remember exactly who was the target, but I remember that it was a unique situation. Um, it was it was a almost like the first cryptocurrency um, crowd looting attack. There was this one attacker that found a vulnerability in one of the I think it may have been a bridge or or a certain on chain protocol, and when he exploited that, it was such an obvious exploit that other people replicated it and mm -hmm. then shared it with other people. So they people just kept draining that protocol and it suddenly just shared with, it, it spread across hundreds of different wallets that started doing the same thing. And it was the only, I think the first time that a, a kind of crowd event happened when people were just looting a protocol because they figured out it was super easy to, to crack. Um, some people ended up um, taking the money just for safekeeping and then giving them back, but some of them completely took advantage of the situation. Yep, I do. I I want to say it was sushi swap, perhaps. It may have been. I, yeah. I, I do remember exactly what. Um, I remember that event. I I just can't recall where or or what the, the 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 name of the entity was, but it sounds very familiar. Yeah, it was it was the one that stuck in my head because it was different from the others. You didn't have a, a concentrated group of people. You had one guy that found out one vulnerability, and then people were like, "Hey, I can do this too." 
Right. And then they just went. <laughs> yeah, and did it. It's crazy. Um, anyway, man, listen, I had a great time uh, talking to you about this. I feel uh, it's definitely something that the industry needs both for growth and support and also for the kind of trust that it needs right now to just get out there in the mainstream. Um, and I wish you guys all the best. I'm going to keep a, a close eye to see what kind of new products you're, you're, you're building and um, just, you know, to be kind of aware of where, where you guys are at and kind of the things you're doing. Uh, do you have any socials or anything specific you want to shout or any announcements you want to make? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, so uh, if anyone that's listening, if they want to follow us, um, you know, Anchain.ai is our website. Uh, Anchain AI is our socials. Uh, and then my personal socials is uh, at the Wolf of Block. Um, <laughs> it's nice. The Wolf of Wall Street, but uh, of Block, the blockchain. <laughs> It's cool handle, man. That's cool handle. Yeah. Grab that on Farcaster before it goes away. Yeah, no, I, I should probably do it before uh, this goes live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's uh, gonna go live. We have we have five, I think, five episodes episodes ahead. So it's gonna go live in about a month or so. Okay. So there, there's time. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Cool, man. Thanks a lot for joining, and have a nice rest of your day. Yep. Likewise, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. See ya. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Cheers.